So this is looking at the work by uh, a mechanical engineering professor at Duke. In fact, Adrian Bijan is the J.A. Jones Distinguished Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Duke University. He's recently written a book on the Constructal Law, which he has uh, discovered in 1995 and has been working over the last few years uh, to understand how this law um, has uh, arisen uh, within nature to cause the configurations of nature <coughs> that result because of flows within nature. And uh, I'll give a little more accurate definition as we get forward, we move forward. But um, when I first saw his description of the constructal law, I thought it was a very interesting and perhaps accurate description of the material world and how it uh, progresses and evolves in time and space. But when I first saw it, I also thought of uh, spiritual connections uh, arose um, very quickly in my mind. And that's what I wanted to investigate here. Um, because uh, being a, a, an engineering professor at a Christian university, I hope to uh, facilitate the thinking of our graduates and our students in engineering, in particular in engineering, in the ways that their engineering uh, is enhanced and related to their understanding of a Christian worldview and their own development of their own personal theology. So as I mentioned, uh, Wesley Oda is uh, gonna jump in here in a few minutes to help me with this presentation, and he's been helping me think about this and, and write on this topic. First of all, just uh, a little plug for multidisciplinary uh, efforts. It seems to me some of the most interesting problems now that we face and questions, the big questions within life, are the ones that need to be addressed from multiple areas, multiple disciplines. And so this is not an easy task. It's, uh, it, it calls for a lot of boundary spanning. I don't know if you're familiar with that phrase, but there's a lot of boundaries even within this own room. Even though we have a pretty much consistent worldview, there's still a lot of boundaries and uh, differences that we have, a diversity of thought. And we need to be gracious with one another and careful with one another to, to be charitable, but also to learn from each other. This is going to require humility. And uh, it's a challenge, but I'm excited that we're, we're undertaking it. I mean, just something like uh, the idea that the human brain, the most complex um, entity in the known universe, uh, can emerge uh, in nature to the point that a human being can think about where they came from, contemplate where they're going, what they are, who they are, and all of these issues. Um, speaks to me of breaking science out of a limited, um, no relationship uh, status that it seems to have been put in in the last few years. Uh, as, as Brian Green, cosmologist at Columbia University, put it in his article, Critical Science in Your Life, science is the greatest of all adventure stories. It needs to be taught to the young and communicated to the mature in a manner that captures this drama. Too often in school, science is quarantined from its implications, the philosophical implications, the metaphysical implications, even theological implications, restricted from interaction with other bodies of knowledge. I think this can lead to a disjointed understanding of reality as a whole, and perhaps even a misunderstanding or lack of purpose, especially in young people's lives. I don't know if you saw the movie Hugo recently, it was a little boy, an orphan boy in that movie, who, who discovers a, a, an old broken automaton uh, robot. Uh, and uh, excellent movie. It's got some really good theology in it, I think. But one of the quotes that I'd like to give just briefly here is, he says, maybe that's why a broken machine always makes me a little sad, because it isn't able to do what it was meant to do. Perhaps it's the same with people. If you lose your purpose, it's like you're broken. Well, uh, Adrian Bichon talks about uh, flow. His book, Design in Nature, How the Constructal Law Governs Evolution in Biology, Physics, Technology, and Social Organizations, um, looks at how flow occurs and then affects 
the conduit or this system which it, in which it flows to cause it to change configuration in order to make that flow full, uh, facilitate that flow. But uh, it, it got me thinking back earlier to forces because flows, as we know as engineers, are produced by uh, pressures or forces within nature, uh, potentials, uh, voltage, causes current flow, pressure, causes fluid flow, these kinds of things. And as I thought about forces, I thought back to my uh, PhD advisor at UCLA, Tino Mingori, who as I was going into my qualifying exam, uh, reminded me, now you, you ought to be ready to answer like, some philosophical questions, some, some questions like, what if they ask you, what is a force? And what are you going to say? I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know. <laughs> but really, a force is just a push or a pull, right? And uh, if you ever played with Legos, you know that very interesting things can be uh, created even by tiny little hands and minds by just pushes and pulls. In fact, uh, you can create a Lego person that looks very much like a real person just by these pushes and pulls on these little Lego blocks. But in reality, when you think about the real person here on the, on the right of this slide, The way that we, we observe reality as engineers is thinking in terms of all these fundamental forces that have occurred throughout history and continue to occur in an orderly and uh, repeatable manner. And really, that's the study of science and engineering, is the study of these forces that, that, that produce pushes and pulls throughout the history of mankind and, and the universe. And, uh, it really is a very simple, I think, and, and useful way of thinking about it. It's just, what is behind these forces? Well, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the metaphysical um, and, and spiritual question that, that uh, I want to bring to Bijan's work. Because forces produce flows, and flows produce certain designs. Uh, Adrian Bijan went to a conference in 1995 in Europe and heard Ilya Prigozhin speak. And uh, Prigogine mentioned that these kinds of occurrences in nature, things like lightning bolts and uh, tree shapes, um, were random. And Dr. Bichon uh, immediately uh, had a problem with that. And he said, in a flash, I realized that if the world was not formed by random accidents, chance, and fate, but that behind the dizzying diversity is a seamless stream of predictable patterns. And here's where he, he uh, on, the, on the airplane ride back, he, he uh, wrote down this constructal law. He says, for a finite size flow system to persist in time, to live, and I'll give you his definition of what it means to live in a moment, its configuration must evolve in such a way that provides easier access to the currents that flow through it. And when I first read this, I, I, I have to admit, I, I uh, well, that's interesting. Um, it makes me think of spiritual realities. And, and in terms of what it means to live, he says, everything that moves, whether animate or inanimate, is a flow system. And he would define living things as anything that's moving. Very much different than how uh, Walter Bradley uh, defined it earlier last night. These flow systems have two basic properties that we need to think about. One is the current. What is the current that's flowing through it? It may be fluid or heat, mass, or Adrian Bijan is very um, ready, ready to um, consider abstract flows, such as ideas, the flow of information. And uh, so, so he's not opposed to thinking in of, of the flow of non-material uh, objects, too. So there's the current, what is that's flowing, and there's also the design through which it flows, or the configuration, or the, or the conduit, which may be changing with time. And this is the whole uh, idea behind this constructal law, is how this flow uh, influences and, and interacts with the surroundings and the conduit through which it flows. What causes the constructal law? Well, Bijan is very upfront about this, says, the short answer is, <clears throat> we don't know. And uh, this is where I think um, it's interesting to consider this question and, and consider it a little deeper 
with, uh, without restricting our knowledge to just science and engineering, but rather opening up our knowledge base to uh, many different forms, forming a hypothesis that may be a spiritual hypothesis, and then investigating the reliability and, or testability of that hypothesis. Now, Dr. Bijan says that he's open to metaphysical implications. He says, in my professional capacity, I see the constructal law as a powerful scientific tool. But as a human being, I also appreciate its <coughs> metaphysical considerations. Poets have long celebrated the balance and harmony of the world, the oneness of nature. The constructal law brings science in line with poetry. It reveals our deep connection. It illuminates the tendency that unites everything that moves. However, he is very quick at the beginning of this book and all the way throughout the book to rule out the possibility of intelligent causation, which I found a little curious because I didn't see places where he provided you know, evidence or uh, rational back backing for that idea. He says, I would develop a new understanding of evolutionary phenomenon and the oneness of nature that would reveal how design emerges without an intelligent designer. Uh, later on, he, on page 13 and 14, he says, of course, there is no conscious intelligence behind these patterns, no divine architect churning out brilliant, blue, brilliant blueprints. To preempt any confusion, let me make this perfectly clear. The constructal law is not headed toward a creationist argument, and in no way does it support the claims of those who promulgate the fantasy of an intelligent design. Anyone who takes excerpts from this book to suggest that I am urging for a spiritual sense of designedness is engaging in an intentional act of dishonesty. So I should be very clear at this point also. I am not going, we are not going to take uh, Dr. Bijan's statements and claim that he is arguing for a spiritual sense of designedness. However, I'm going to take several of his statements and I am going to argue for a spiritual sense of designedness. And he makes this point over and over and over. It gets a little tiresome within the book. Pages 20, 29, 31, 36, 53, 55, 56, 79, 127, to make this point over and over again. I'm not sure if it was all him or whether his publishers required him to, to make these uh, repeated points about this. But Lewis, in the mere Christianity, said, uh, you know, when you think about the universe, and especially the moral moral law, moral sense that, that all people seem to share. There's something which is directing the universe and which appears to me as a law urging me to do right and making me feel responsible when I do wrong. I think we have to assume that it is more like a mind than it is like anything else. We know. Because after all, the only thing we know is matter and you can hardly imagine a bit of matter giving such kind of instruction. So what is flowing? That's one of the questions, that's the key question to help us uh, predict how something will evolve um, in the midst of this flow. The riddle of design is solved by asking what is flowing. And all of these quotes that just simply have a page number after them are from Bichon's book, Design and Nature. If we know what is moving through a flow system, we can predict the sequence of designs that will emerge and evolve to facilitate the currents that run through it. So what I'd like to consider, and actually what Bichon considers multiple times within his book, is the human being as the flow system. He says that human beings are flow systems. Through the book, I hope to help you recognize how the constructive law is shaping everything around and within you. Human beings are also flow systems. Internally, the flow of blood carries oxygen and food through a tree-like network of blood vessels to organs whose size and shape are just right to enable us to move efficiently per amount of useful energy derived from food. So you can see that we, the, you know, the ready application of this is for the, in terms of the physical, in terms of the material. Uh, food, air, water are all taken in by the human being. They flow through the body and, and are expelled. And so we definitely are flow systems in that sense. We're continually moving if we're alive. And so we're, we're obviously flow systems according to his uh, definition. But what is there something that's deeper? Is there something at a deeper level here for human beings? That's the question. 
So he also says, to know why things look the way they do, first recognize what flows through them, and then think of what shape and structure should emerge to facilitate that flow. <coughs> Let's think of this in terms of uh, a spiritual or metaphysical uh, life. What is it that sustains uh, something beyond just physical life? Think of Matthew 4.4 4, where Jesus says, Man shall not live by bread alone. Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's actually a quote from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 8, 2 to 3. Here's the context. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness in those 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what you, was in your heart, whether or not you would keep His commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It also makes me think of Isaiah, where uh, Isaiah says, just as rain falls to the earth and does not return until it produces bread for the eater, uh, so my word will proceed from my mouth and will not return void, but accomplish the purposes for which I have said it. John says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So there's a sense here in which we see Jesus as God's sustaining word. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. There's something deeper here than just the food that we ate for breakfast, you know. There's something that sustains us that's, that's on a, a higher level. And when Jesus said this, many, many of them, were, it was too hard for them. They, 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 they took off. They weren't going to accept this, this teaching. And then later on we see that there's this uh, the Holy Spirit. As I, I will ask the Father, and He will send you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And if you look at the New Testament, the teaching about the flow of the Holy Spirit within the life of the believer, this is another concept. There's, there's many concepts that, that you can think of in terms of flowing in the life of a, of a believer, in terms of the Spirit, in terms of truth, faith, love, hope even. Uh, again, in other places, John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. This is talking in terms of remaining within the flow of Jesus' life. Bijan, let me go back to Dr. Bijan. He admits there's a need for freedom here in the Constructal Law. He said, if I were to add two words to the Constructal Law, they would be these, given freedom. And he recognizes that bad ideas make it harder for human beings to thrive. He gives an example here of good ideas causing human beings to be able to thrive. And he talks about his, his upbringing in, in Romania under uh, communism and uh, many bad ideas that were in place at that time. A prerequisite then is for the flow system to be free to morph. The emerging flow architecture is the means by which the flow system achieves its objectives under constraints. Freedom is good for design. This can be thought of in a couple different senses. For, for one, we all have this common experience of free will. And, and this is necessary for us to, to reach our full potential in terms of flow systems and a spiritual flow. But there's also this idea that, that comes up that another c common definition of freedom, especially in the Christian community, is that do you have the freedom to do what you know is right? And this is a, a key uh, doctrine within Christianity is uh, and, and unless you have uh, recognized Jesus, accepted uh, him, you, you basically are unable to do what is right. You don't have that freedom. So there's, there could be something blocking the flow um, that 
that requires a, a need for this kind of, of uh, redemption or my Savior. But there's also a need for resistance. On page 42, he says, imperfections are unavoidable. In fact, they are necessary. Without imperfections or resistances, flow systems would accelerate continuously, eventually spinning out of control. And perhaps, uh, in a Christian sense, you have the negatives associated with life that resist. Things like evil, pain and suffering. Uh, Henry Petrosky talks about this in his book, Success Through Failure, The Paradox of Design, or the myth of perfect design. There's no such thing as perfect design. Bichon says, good design involves the nearly uniform distribution of imperfection throughout the entire flow system. Uh, I'm going to skip over a couple slides and make sure we have enough time. I think this is the last slide before Wesley comes up, so come on up. Um, Bichon says that vascularization contains the pivotal idea of life-giving flow and of a body filled with life. It reminds us that design arises in order to spread often nourishing currents. The vascular structure of our circulatory system is an example. Or, he says, for a business to persist in time, it must deliver life-giving ideas to its customers and to its employees. Everything evolves in order to provide greater access to the life-sustaining currents that run through its vasculature. This is a, kind of an updated version of his constructal law. Um, I've always been relatively fascinated with the um, uh, parallels. I had my first encounter with the idea of uh, things that were parallel when I was a gymnast um, as a young age, um, uh, at a young age. And um, but at first, uh, and it doesn't—you don't have to do jump through hoops or do gymnastics to understand the basic ideas of what it means to be parallel with something else, um, and some of its applications on you know beyond the first dimension. Um, um, and then also, there's some more obscure applications. But uh, for the sake of Euclid, I'll refer. I'll refrain from going into non-Euclidean geometry and the idea that some things might even be parallel with themselves. Skipping over that, uh, where else can parallelism be applied? Uh, you can take, uh, I mean, physical parallelism is where it originated, but then you can also think about things that are parallel in nature um, as opposed to parallel physically. Um, and we find this often in literature, which is one of the, our main means of communicating when, where we see similarities between different things. Um, there's things like uh, analogy, allegory, illusion, metaphor, parable, exemplum, simile, and symbolism. These are all have elements of parallelism where you're describing one thing with another. And they're often used um, for means of education. One, one of the best ways to learn things is if someone doesn't understand something directly, you can take, you can show them uh, a situation or another uh, model which is similar um, and then that they do understand and then show them where the similarities lie and then kind of bring them back around to the direct concept through this association and hope they have a better understanding of the direct concept. Um, and, uh, but in the same way that all flow systems are subject to the eventual <coughs> ceasing, you, can't, you can only distribute imperfections uh, so much and it eventually it will stop. Every parallel stops and has a, um, a breaking point where it can't go any further. Um, it's kind of uh, similar to um, a shadow. A shadow is only an outline of, of the actual form. It has no depth. It just gives you a general idea of what that thing, form, the shape might look like, but there's no real depth to it. Um, and what I realized um, while reading this book was that um, parallels throughout nature were, were what helped Adrian Bajan realize, uh, kind of guided him to the realization of constructive law, because he was noticing that uh, there were parallels in the structures throughout nature, trees, lightning, vasculature, um, and then also noticing the parallels in the design that he was coming up with in his work with thermodynamics. Um, and, and realizing that as he was you know, trying to get um, heat outside of electronics, you have to kind of create an almost dendritic you know, system in order to distribute that heat efficiently. And it started to realize that it was similar to things he was seeing in nature. Um, and so he says that the similarities among these tree-like structures are clear to the naked eye. What they couldn't see was that the scientific principle that governs the design of these diverse phenomena. Um, and he says that the engineer world that we have built um, so that we can move more easily does not copy any part of the natural design. It is a manifestation of it. And he kind of goes against, uh, uh, he doesn't like uh, biomimetics so much because he thinks that it's just a poor um, way to do, to go about designing things when you could actually just look at the principle rather than copying something else's, you know, manifestation of that principle. 
Um, and it's also uh, because of the development of its you know, parallel nature, because uh, he realized constructor law through parallelism, it also shows why the constructor law made parallelism so rampant in nature. Because if you apply the same end, like the same goal for every system, which is to distribute imperfections, they will tend to develop in similar ways, which is why there's so many parallels in nature, um, and why there's constructor law so applicable throughout nature. Um, he says that uh, I and many other researchers have not found a single flow system that cannot be predicted by the constructor law. The applications are so numerous that the constructor law is still in its infancy. Human organizations are also area to point or point to area flow systems. Governments, corporations, religious groups, universities, sports teams, communication, transportation networks, cities, nations, etc. They all produce and transmit currents such as goods, services, people, and information to an area uh, through actual channels. Science, for instance, uh, for example, generates actual channels for the organization and spread of its current, which is knowledge. And this is where he starts touching on abstract ideas rather than physical flow systems. Um, using that and taking it a little bit further, which is uh, where we got the idea to, or Dr. Hosmer got the idea to apply it to um, spiritual flow. Um, and considering the spirit, um, if we were to try and apply the constructor law to that, uh, to the, the idea of spiritual flow, we have to consider what is flowing and what is it flowing through based on Adrian's, uh, Adrian Bajan's model, uh, or what he suggests. And so what is flowing is, is the spirit, which is often associated with life, truth, and light. And so there's three different flow systems which you can investigate. The flow of life, which could be seen as persistence based on his earlier definition. And uh, we have the flow of truth, which could be considered as the contribution to global, global flow. And also the flow of light, which is illumination for truth or guidance through form resistance. Um, and then uh, the conduit for these flows is people. The establishment or dismantling of relationships between people is the primary means by which this system evolves over time. The way that the spirit can flow through people is from one, one person to another. Um, if you were filled with the spirit and you he, and you're revealed some sort of truth about reality, it's kind of almost selfish to hold on to it and not tell anyone. You have to let it go and pass it on to someone else, or you know, be willing to receive it from someone else. Um, and that's how the, the establishment of this structure develops over time um, for the flow of the spirit. Um, and then Major Bijan says that in many in previous chapters we have observed that almost all flow systems carry a current from point to area or area from an area to a point. And this is like when people are linking up, like a mass of people which are separated. Um, and not you know, working together, as they start to develop relationships, this is the area to point as they start to become one. And so and that's you know, one of the ways that we can look at the system. So. Well, in summary then, um, Bijan asserts that flow configurations throughout nature in a universal sense are not random but follow law, the constructal law specifically. Uh, life by receptivity to nourishing flows basically is uh, what he sees in nature. Uh, but his definition of life is very different from the traditional definition. It's just motion, basically, and it can be so inanimate things, a river can be living until it ceases flowing and is a dry riverbed, in which case there's no more life there. Uh, what causes the constructor law? What causes flow? Don't know. Um, but I think this is an interesting and important question to not just shrug off, but rather, when we look at nature, when we see flows, we see that there's always a cause for those flows. Uh, and so, I think it's an important question to consider. Uh, there's interesting metaphysical implications uh, as a result. Uh, why rule out intelligent causation prematurely? Uh, is a question I have for him. And in thinking about human beings, what, what is it that's flowing? What is it that really gives life uh, to human beings? And, and the concept of Jesus as the consumable and nourishing word of God uh, rises to the top for a Christian. Uh, it's necessary, though, to have both freedom and resistance uh, for the human being to ultimately progress and mature to the place of uh, greatest potential. We talked about vasculature. I skipped over hierarchy. And it seems that uh, even the scripture is full of you know, nature parables, which seem to be a shadow. Even the scripture talks about a shadow of the reality of Jesus Christ. And that's uh, what I'd like to conclude with. Is just that, well, this appears to me to be a confirmation of, of a Christian worldview in which 
Um, these things are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you folks can help us become a little more focused uh, in this study, because at this point, at the beginning of, of our study of the constructal law, I realize we're, we're kind of all over the place, and uh, I'm looking for some, some direction. So, yeah, question. Um, so on the, on the constructal law, it seems to me that it might be more or less a restatement of, of purpose. And that if uh, um, if what he's saying, because it, it seems like in, in many of those places he could have said that um, everything in nature is flowing according to its purpose, um, and he would not have changed the definition very much. Um, that if you that if you insert, and, and so basically um, that purposeful flows. Um, um, Basically, giving a general definition of flow, and just uh, assigning how you how you would uh, that that when we see flows in nature, that they tend to have a purpose, and that they are they are acting in congruence with their purpose. You know that was one of the minor themes that he brought out in the book that I did not have time to throw into the presentation is that he talks about purpose, uh, and in fact even hope and. Uh, the promise of a better future, um, and I, that's an area that I still haven't, um, I'm still wrestling with. Is, is is apparently he's looking at purpose, not in terms of an ultimate purpose that, that arises from an intelligent causation for of all of all nature, but something that. Uh, is teleological in terms of it has its own end goal and is it made perhaps. Uh, is there an idea that there's something overall that's flowing in every single kind of flow? Is there a higher thing that's flowing through everything? He does not talk about that at all. Okay. Um, so in that sense, I didn't get a pantheistic kind of view from his work, it was more of a atheistic kind of view. Well, I wanted to touch on your, your comment <coughs> on purpose. That's one of the ways that I'm actually kind of critical of uh, Adrian Bajan. I feel like he uh, kind of misunderstood the true meaning of purpose. Because um, it seems that in you know atheistic science, you know, where you're completely disregarding the possibility of an intelligent designer, um, it's they, they're often trying to <coughs> take away the purpose in life. There's no because everything is accidental. Everything is you know by chance. And there's really no purpose in a situation like that. It leaves no room for purpose. Adrian Bajan likes the idea of purpose, and he tries to bring it into the book, but I think that he misunderstands purpose, and he, leave, he, he tries to give it this false identity of uh, just like the byproduct of, not, of, a, of a requirement from physics. Um, and so it really kind of, he calls it purpose, but it seems like empty to me. And that's actually where I'm kind of critical of him. But then he brings purpose into, this, uh, into the idea of global flow, and, and I can get into it, I can discuss that more, but. Uh, Alexander? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Dominic, yesterday you asked me what I thought about Jean's work, and I kind of deferred, saying that I, it was problematic for me. It's difficult to capture, and so the first thing I want to do is to thank you very much, because you actually pulled in some of the quotes that, that, that are, in fact, very problematic with, uh, with Jean's stuff. Um, and it largely stems from a lack of distinction. It really largely stems from a lack of distinction. And uh, the other aspect that makes that very difficult to address in any kind of soundbite way, in fact, it shouldn't be addressed in a soundbite way, is to properly draw those distinctions. You know, for example, flow. Um, any physicist will tell you that there's nothing really that's flowing in heat. Molecules are moving together and they're transferring kinetic energy to their to their to the to their near being par particles and so on. Right. Okay, but but the heat energy, the energy is what? Energy is a capacity to do work. Right. So you have to then ask the distinction: Is a capacity the same kind of thing as a molecule? Well, he allows for both abstract things to be flowing as well as physical things to be flowing. So, they, but that's begging of the question. What does he mean by abstract 
flow. What does it mean for something that's abstract to flow? And that begs the further question of what do you mean by abstract? And, and his work is just full. It's just, set, it's just saturated with, uh, with all these kind of lack of distinctions that, have, that actually, I think, uh, don't contribute to the discussion. They actually muddle the discussion because he's kind of getting everything. He's ontologically flattening everything to one kind of thing. When you use flow in electricity or when you use flow in heat on the physics level, you are absolutely talking in terms of a metaphor. There is nothing that's flowing. Of course, there's electron drift velocity, but they're moving in the opposite direction of the current. Okay. So it's so it, it's it, that lack of distinction, and then trying to apply it uniformly to all existence, because he has some this kind of attraction to unity, to the idea of unity, forgetting even the distinctions that happen in unity. There are accidental unities, and there are substantive unities. And just because you pile things together in a pile doesn't mean that that somehow inherits that thing into being a real substantive unity. That, so, I mean, I, I can spend hours, you know, pick, picking apart what he says. Um, and that's my worry, is that once you start down the road of not doing distinctions, you automatically go to a, this kind of ontological flattening or reductionist view of reality. He's basically got one tool. It's called a hammer. And every problem that presents itself to him is a nail that he likes to that he likes to pull under unity and solve this way. That that's kind of the deep seated problem uh, that I have with him. Any suggestions on how we should proceed? I, I, I it's far be it from me. I mean the, the, I what I wanted to do is to spur the thinking to be critical of that thing and then let you know, the, the creative and intellectual juices flow. I can't, I can't answer that. Well, yeah. I would highly recommend that if you're interested in pursuing this, you go and read Craig Jean's book that he wrote in 1977. It doesn't surprise me that uh, that he came up with these ideas kind of back to the Christian conference, but he's making, I think, a big to-do about nothing because uh, uh, almost everything he's talking about is nothing more than what happens in nature is it goes from systems that are highly non equilibrium with a natural tendency through the second law to move toward equilibrium. Mm -hmm. There's nothing very mysterious about this, and almost every kind of flow that you can think of in nature mm -hmm. uh, is basically that response of systems moving towards equilibrium, whether it's mm -hmm. a heat gradient or whether it's a uh, electrical field gradient or a potential energy gradient or whatever. And moving from any type of higher intensity to a lower intensity, yeah. you've got so a geometric progression. Each time you have gradient shift, yeah, things got to be circular. Now, exactly. I think the second law simply says things naturally go from non equilibrium to equilibrium. Now, right, but his point is what happens to the conduit? What happens to, to what, how does the environment change in response to that? His claim for the constructor law is that it must facilitate the flow. It must open itself up to the flow of well, The pictures that you showed all are basically pretty standard from Craig Jean's work on bifurcation. Okay? And there's nothing very mysterious about that. It comes out of non equilibrium thermodynamics. And so uh, I think a lot of these things are, uh, they have a commonality in that they look the same, and they're very different systems that are experiencing the same kinds of uh, non equilibrium thermodynamic uh, uh, bifurcations. And so uh, at some point, I feel like that a lot of what he seems to be saying, based on what you guys have shared today, is nothing more than taking really sound work by Prigogine that's fundamentally based on universal thermodynamics and trying to sort of spin uh, some sort of a story uh, that seems to be, uh, I'm surprised that he does acknowledge Prigogine, but in fact almost everything he's talking about seems to be stuff that's well established Mm -hmm. in irreversible thermodynamics, which is what Prigogine got the Nobel Prize for. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not like, oh my gosh, it's so mysterious how all these things happen. I don't think right. it's, you know. Um, would, would somebody care to comment on, I mean, I found his work provocative towards uh, the spiritual realm in terms of recognizing this, this flow, having no explanation for what, why it, it is there, why, how it's caused. And, and the fact that 
it sort of points towards human beings as conduits. With, but there's something even more significant that's intended to flow through human beings. Um, that's kind of a tree of life. There is an entire school of rabbinic thought of how the emanations of God go from the throne of God <coughs> through the, the realms, if you will, you know, the spiritual realm into the natural realm. And that the, the tree of life is just this phrase that is used for this whole entire concept of thought. And as far as how the emanations of God go from the in self, the, the infinite source, down through his creation into Malkut, which is our reality. And so that real what you're as far as the 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 flow of God, if you will, side of it is very much Jewish. the Ed's kind, this this whole school of thought. Yeah. Thank you. Well I just have I one, one quick addition to that is that's also a big part of Orthodox thought. Orthodox. Mm -hmm. Like one big distinction between them and Western Christian thought is they believe God interacts with uh, his creation through some kind of divine energies. And so that's very much along the idea of divine energies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, I wonder if, uh, if uh, the proposition here is to see the flow as a primary uh, primary essence, a primary cause, which, uh, which is a, a new formula for self-organization. And I think my attitude is, is that it's credible. It doesn't seem to be legitimate to put flow in such a primary, uh, uh, fundamental position. Flow seems to be rather a consequence of some other setup, context, uh, origination. Uh, the single way in which I would, I would accept the paradigm or the, the metaphor, it's the, uh, the flow of information or the flow of logos which sympathizes with this observation that that uh, uh, God originated uh, through his wisdom, his logos, create, his creation power, and so on. But putting the, the flow, which is just a consequence, is a side effect of other uh, creation forces or, or, or design, putting a primary position, I think, it's, is not credible for me. The potentiality at the beginning of creation is that it was very low entropy, which is to say it's right. not an equilibrium. And so an awful lot of that got built into As natural flow. the system a priori, yes. Mm -hmm. That was part of the, you can't explain this from natural laws, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it goes completely contrary to yeah. the initial uh, creation. Yeah. Alexander? Um, maybe someone ahead of me could ask a question. So, uh, you're talking about uh, patterns of nature. That's already been studied by Mendel Brock's fractals. Yeah, he, get, he, uh, he mentions that in his book. Um, okay. And it kind of plays off that. But uh, it, it's a, it's a, I think it's a fundamentally different idea. Uh, th well, this idea, uh, the fascinating mm -hmm. one to me, is, is the idea that a, a flow system must open itself up to facilitate that nourishing, life-giving flow that runs through it in order to then persist in time. Well, fractals itself is just finding the continuous pattern in nature. That if you find this pattern in a certain tree, you can find it anywhere else in the tree. John? Um, well, one thing is that the, I think what, what, what's most interesting is the, the relationship between the um, kind of the artificial flows versus, versus the natural flows, and, and how much similarity there is between what happens in, say, a lightning strike versus what happens in distributing um, uh, government to, to people. Ideas, the flow of ideas. Yeah, um, and that um, it, 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 I think it kind of indicates, I mean, I think it goes along, obviously it's, it, it, the, the lightning strike is implemented via the Standard laws of thermodynamics, yeah, but the universal term. Um, but the uh, I think the the concept is is that um, 
you know, just, just like other aspects of design, um, you have basically a conduit to, uh, to move uh, electrical flow um, where it's needed without having uh, over, um, you know, too much or too little um, that allows the flow in, in, you know, certain constrained but makes it all the way there type of, type of flows. And so I think that's, that's what's most interesting about constructible theory is that um, it's the, when you compare kind of what's happening in both cases, um, you find this, this great similarity um, which kind of helps you see purpose, purpose, purposefulness mm -hmm. in a variety of, uh, of different applications. Mm -hmm. That's what made me think of the shadow. You can do a search on, on shadow in, in the scriptures and you see uh, multiple times where it talks about this, this world being a shadow of, of the ultimate true, true real, reality. Outside. Yeah, um, I'm going to give another example from, from his writings that, that's uh, perhaps in terms of its implications uh, most problematic. Uh, for example, when you mentioned him um, in his vision of flow configuration following the law. This, the misunderstanding of the word law, it just runs, it, it just runs all through the natural sciences. As if, a, as if there's this kind of platonic law out there directing traffic and making things happen because of that way. Whenever scientists actually use the word law, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor that describes the imminent orderliness of things. Natures act out their natures in an orderly way. We observe that order, we try to understand it, and hence understand reality. But if you flip that on its head and think that there's no natures, that things behave only because there's always an externalist kind of tinkering, if you will, with every existent out there, you go down another path. You actually go down a very, very reductionist uh, path. Things have natures. Things have, in fact, a telos. Right. They have an end, right. and, and which leads to the other confusion that happens with this word purpose or final causality. Right. People think that, and, you know, it, it boggles my mind sometimes, but Aristotle got it right 2,450 years ago. He says directly in his physics, what are you nuts? I mean, I'm paraphrasing. He says, what are you nuts? Rocks don't have a purpose. Rocks don't have a purpose. Rocks have an end that can be described by physics. In an, and they, 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 uh, they, I'm not going to use the word targeted, but that's loaded, are targeted toward that end, okay? Because it's in their natures to actualize their ends. You go up to the next level, perfection is another term, right? Acorns perfect their natures by being actualized into mature uh, oak trees. And then the final one, the first two were teleonomy. The last one is true teleology, whereas a rational agent has what's called an intensio, real purpose, real purpose for an end. I have it in my mind to sculpt the, the you know, the sculpture or something. That's teleology as opposed to teleonomy within the broader rubric of final causality. But in his world, in Bijan's world, you can never get to that. You can never get to those distinctions right. because everything keeps on getting compressed. Right. The challenge is for us to interact with folks like Adrian sure. Bijan, even though we have such different fundamental ideas and, sure. and maybe even definitions. So we're trying to kind of extract uh, the value of what he's discovered and, and show how uh, it relates to the Christian world. Sure. Thank you. Thanks.